So I'm on, are we on? Kind of. Um, yeah, just. People are people. coming in, yeah, I can see. Yep. Welcome everybody to Imaging One World. Um, you found your way to our Zoom channel and I hope, um, I think most of you come for the many multiple repeat session, but um, I've been, uh, wanting to introduce so the people who organize Imaging One World and started it is myself, Stephanie Weichert from Cambridge University, Alex Sosik from the Gurdon Institute, also Cambridge, Nick Barry from the MRC LMB, and there's Kirti Prakash, who is now at the NPL in London or outside London, and there's also Alessandro Esposito from the um, Cambridge as well, Cambridge University. So we got together to initiate this online lecture and I think it's in lecture, lecture series and it seems it's still kind of necessary to communicate um, through Zoom with them, um, but it's also brought together, I think a huge community much greater than we had hoped and expected. Um, what I have to say as well today for the future planning, we are very happy that um, the Royal Microscopic Society, especially Georgina and also Jessica now is supporting us. Um, and um, we also have um, this wonderful quiz which you, through which you can win a fold scope, which we continue to do in the new year. But um, as a date um, and reminder, the 24th of January is going to be the next Imaging One World lecture because we will have a break over Christmas and we're kind of just getting our agenda together. And you can also, if you have um, ideas for speakers, if you wish to speak yourself, please contact us and uh, we will be very happy to consider you. Today, it's a great pleasure to have Richard Bowman um, as our speaker. Richard, um, we know from Cambridge and his work, but he's now at the um, University of Bath. And Richard, um, I think it will be wonderful to hear how he has been using um, very low maintenance, innovative 3D printed, approaches to microscopy but has really taken them very far further than most of us can imagine because he is also um, provides uh, through a company um, microscopy and imaging in Africa in Tanzania and I Richard will talk about all of this much better than I can but he was in Cambridge and very instrumental in the um, systems biology nanophotonics um, um, make space um, alternative funky imaging project development and um, yeah and uh, but really I think has taken this really further and further and not just having it as a playful outsourcing tool but um, he will show us how this can actually be used very kind of successfully and very professionally worldwide and Richard that's my introduction please talk now Lovely. yourself Thank about you. smart microscopy for everyone. <laughs> Thank you. Um, great. This is not a toy. Uh, it's made of colorful plastic. It fits in a shoebox and it costs less than an Xbox. Nonetheless, uh, I think it's a serious piece of scientific equipment. and I'm very happy to have a little time to talk more about it and about the community that's grown up around it. Uh, I often give the title Smart Microscopy for Everyone, and that begs the question, why does everyone need microscopy? Well, there are lots of reasons, and I probably don't need to convince this audience anyway, um, but microscopes get found everywhere from education, scientific research, environmental monitoring. The one that drives the Open Flexure project is this. This is a Plasmodium falciparum, uh, is the parasite that's responsible for malaria. Every year that affects something like 200 million people and about half a million of those people will die. Mostly children under the age of five and the vast majority in Africa. As the fight against malaria has progressed, 
uh, far fewer cases and deaths occur each year. The, these numbers are tragic, but they're not nearly as tragic as they were 20 years ago. But that makes good diagnosis even more important than ever, um, because it's no longer a good idea to just assume that every fever is caused by malaria. Um, you have to actually check. Um, a microscopy is still regarded as the gold standard diagnosis for doing this. Um, done properly, it's more accurate and more quantitative than the rapid tests. And the Open Flexure project makes automated digital microscopes available at a manageable price, at a similar price to the uh, manual microscopes that are in use at the moment. Um, digital microscopy allows better record keeping, which is really important for quality assurance. Um, it allows a technician to get a second opinion from someone somewhere else. It allows a technician to prove that a test actually happened and was done competently. Um, and it can be very useful for training technicians because there's that classic microscopy teaching challenge of how do I have any idea what the student is actually seeing when they're looking down the eyepieces. And lastly, the open flexion microscope is designed to be produced locally. So we're making these in Tanzania. Well, our manufacturing partners are making these in Tanzania. Um, and that sidesteps some really tough supply chain issues that stop a lot of donated uh, medical and scientific equipment from functioning as intended in Africa. Um, you often need consumables, spare parts, service engineers. All of these things are missing if it's simply donated from somewhere else. Um, but actually, local production means you've got someone on hand who can fix your microscope when it inevitably does break. I'm very much a microscopist from a, a physical science and engineering background. Um, and the open flexion microscope started as a curiosity in my lab on a Friday afternoon. And I was interested in how 3D printing could enable us to properly replicate a meaningfully complicated piece of scientific equipment. Um, it turns out this actually works quite well, uh, and it's now been replicated all over the world. Uh, the map that forms the background of this slide goes out of date really very quickly. Um, and that made it work very well as a piece of open hardware. So all of the uh, designs, all of the documentation, all of the software um, are available under open licenses uh, from the website. And the microscope has evolved to be easy to replicate. And we put a lot of work into both the instructions and the design of the parts um, to make it easy to do. So hundreds of people have done it. Um, and I'm very proud of that because I think it's a lot more than uh, many scientific instrument designs, even ones that are fully published. Um, it is important to be clear that while I think open hardware is by and large the right way to do experimental science, that I don't think that means it always has to be cheap. Um, or indeed easy. But the Open Flexure project aims at a sweet spot where the instruments are easy enough that you can replicate them without a lot of effort, but still useful enough to contribute to, to serious research. And that makes the Open Flexure project a very interesting test bed for issues around um, sharing and uh, open source. Lastly, the potential of a design like this takes a lot of people to realize uh, from a lot of different places and a lot of different disciplines. I'll talk more about this later, but um, my team and I have put a lot of effort into building a community around this microscope design. Um, and it's been incredibly rewarding to see a, a really diverse group of people interacting with microscopy from, from very different backgrounds. At this point, I'm going to take a, a brief step back and, and just ask what is a microscope? Well, um, what I usually think of when someone says a microscope in a research lab is something like this. I'm sure this kind of inverted optical microscope is very familiar to most of you. Um, and when you say an optical microscope, immediately you think, well, it's all about the optics. But 99% of the size and weight of this microscope is mechanics. Um, and actually moving your sample around, putting it in the right place, getting it just the right distance from your objective lens, and then keeping it there until you've made whatever observation you want to make. That's a huge part of the engineering challenge of designing a good microscope. Um, so 
if we could do that part more efficiently, then that opens a lot of doors. Um, and I was curious if 3D printing was going to be able to do that. So why print a microscope? Well, for starters, you can make it quite small. Um, so the microscope's about 20 centimeters tall once it's fully built. Uh, it can fit into an incubator or a safety cabinet, or indeed carried to a field location in a shoebox sized case, or in the early days of the project, a literal shoebox. Um, you could also imagine having lots of these in a lab. 10 or 20 of these microscopes would quite comfortably fit on a lab bench or indeed a shelving unit. Um, it also means that the mechanics are relatively inexpensive rather than having to do a bunch of CNC machining. Um, you can just print it and most of the mechanics prints in a single piece. Um, so about 200 pounds worth of parts gets you a fully motorized digital microscope complete with a computer and a camera. And a more basic one is less than half that. That opens up a lot of possibilities for using it in contexts that we wouldn't ordinarily be able to have a nice automated microscope, whether that's education or a research lab that has a smaller budget. I've already mentioned the ease of replication um, being important. And this kind of decreasing of the barrier between a digital design and a physical instrument um, allows us to exchange things um, much more easily. So I have shared the design, other people have improved that design and shared those improvements back with me. Um, and this is all enabled by the fact that the step from a digital design, which is of course, trivially easy to, to share um, to a physical one is much easier when you're um, using 3D printing to make your pieces. Um, and it really excites me when collaborators start thinking of what we've done as either a component in their larger system or as a platform that they can build their own science on top of. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how the microscope works um, and then touch on some kind of building blocks that I think are necessary steps towards doing big smart microscopy experiments. Um, I'll talk then a little bit about joining up hardware in the lab, um, because that's something, again, that we've spent quite a lot of time thinking about. And the idea that you can have a very easy to get hold of, uh, but fully automated instrument, um, potentially open some doors there. Then I will finish by taking a whistle stop tour around the Open Flexure community um, and mention a bit about our work towards diagnostics. So on the subject of how it works, I've said the initial contribution of the open flexure microscope is the mechanics. Um, and the key here is implementing a nice linear translation stage. And by nice, I mean that we can move something up and down or side to side without it wobbling in the other directions, without it changing angle, uh, without it sticking or jamming. Um, and normally that's done with a, a dovetail mechanism. So we have two pieces of metal, uh, a rail and a slider. One piece, one piece fits tightly over the other and it can slide up and down. In order to do that, uh, the parts have to be very precisely machined. They have to be exactly the right size, otherwise they're either too stiff, too uh, tight or too loose. The surfaces all have to be very smooth. Um, the tolerances are precise uh, and of course everything has to be very hard because otherwise it wears down over time and gets sloppy. Um, and making it out of a hard material then, of course, means it's harder to machine. So when you pay a large amount of money for a nice mechanical platform for your microscope, uh, I don't think you're being ripped off. I think what you're buying is actually just quite hard to make. Um, and if you try and make it more cheaply, for example, by 3D printing exactly this mechanism, what you'll find is that it's kind of rubbish. The 3D printed parts don't have smooth surfaces, so uh, they stick and jam. The tolerances aren't very precise, so almost certainly it will either be too loose or too tight. Um, and the 3D printed plastic is relatively soft. So if you run it up and down a lot, it will wear and it will get slack. Um, so instead, the open flexure microscope uses flexure hinges. You can see there are four thin points in this parallelogram that's just appeared. Um, those are the flexures. 
just like the lid on your shampoo bottle, it's a thin piece of plastic that is bendy. Um, and because we've got this parallelogram shape, we can move one side up and down while the other side stays static. So it achieves more or less exactly the same motion as the dovetail, but it does it without any sliding. It's just distorting the plastic. And because the plastic is softer than metal, it can move further in a mechanism the same size uh, than a metal flexor stage. And so we, we're using the plastics properties as a good thing now, um, which works much better. That parallelogram mechanism really is the core of, of how the microscope works. Um, and if I start with, well, actually, this is version two of the microscope, but you should just about be able to see in there that there is a little parallelogram. And that's what was responsible for focusing the objective lens up and down. This then evolved um, over a few months. Uh, I added parallelograms to move in X and Y as well as in Z. And I created the world's floppiest, least vibrationally stable microscope. I changed the design uh, to make it much, much stiffer in the axial direction, and that improved performance immensely. Um, and then finally, we got to version five, uh, which is a bit more like the, the microscopes that I work with today, which are version six and seven. Um, but that structure with the three vertical actuators that move in X, Y, and Z uh, has stayed the same. And at this point, I'll show you the most boring movie I've ever included in a talk, uh, which I'll come back to, that was just aiming to make the point that it's actually remarkably mechanically stable. This is a time lapse over a week. Um, and those two beads are something like six microns apart. So this is the open flexure microscope um, in its current version. Um, it's got most of the bits that you would expect from a microscope. Um, there's an LED uh, and a condenser lens up at the top, um, an RMS threaded objective, a tube lens inside the little optics module, the precision XYZ translation stage at the heart. Um, and then at the bottom, there's a bucket that holds all of the electronics. Um, now, I realize I've got a video in here that is going to attempt to actually wave one at you. Um, I just need to make sure you can hear my sound. Uh, if somebody could wave at me or stick a message in the chat, if the sound doesn't work, that would be, but helpful. hopefully I can show you it in, uh, in the flesh as it were. Um, so this is an assembled open flexure microscope. Um, you can see the three, uh, three little stepper motors here, which, uh, aren't shown in the render and, uh, the led at the top for illumination. Um, there's a microscope objective hidden inside the stage there and the optics module with another lens and the Raspberry Pi camera module. And these two buckets at the bottom hide the electronics and the Raspberry Pi and make it all a nice integrated unit. Um, and you'll notice the two dangling USB cables. Um, that's because the whole thing can be quite comfortably powered by my USB power bank. Right, uh, well, I, I hope you'll accept that in lieu of being able to play with the real thing at an actual talk. Um, I should go on to then talk a little bit about what it can see because it is after all a microscope and it wouldn't be fair to not include some images. Um, most of the time we actually just run this in transmission bright field. Um, that's what's typically used for malaria diagnostics and indeed lots of other diagnostics um, in, well, all over sub-Saharan Africa uh, where a lot of these parasitic conditions are quite common. Uh, we can set it up in different ways though. For example, we can do reflection imaging, um, and this shows a picture taken by some project students who were hunting for monolayers of graphene. Um, I think this is a bilayer they found, but uh, the microscope was able to, to do that and, of course, to be automated. Uh, we can add polarizers if you've got an optically active sample like a, a liquid crystal. Um, and we can set it up in fluorescence uh, using basically a totally standard fluorescence filter cube, just shrunk down by a factor of two. To be a little more quantitative about the imaging performance, um, we're able to extract from an edge and an image an estimate of the point spread function. Um, and we reckon we're getting something like 480 nanometers with our 40 times objective, which seems pretty reasonable um, given the spec of it. But actually, I think the optics are in many ways the least interesting 
part of the microscope. Um, and what I think is, is a lot of fun is when people actually bring their own optics. Um, so the Delta stage is a design that we've started using more in the last couple of years, um, where the sample moves in 3D and the optics stay static. That's largely been done so that we can allow people to put their own optics in. Um, and it's been really cool to see, uh, there's a couple of examples, for example, from uh, Brian Patton's group and also from uh, Benedict Diedrich in Jena, who integrated it into a UC2 system, where they've put external optics to do super resolution, um, in Brian's case, or phase imaging, or uh, structured illumination microscopy. Um, so there's a lot of possibilities enabled by just having a really nice mechanical mount for your sample and your objective lens, um, which, in my view, is largely what you buy when you buy a microscope body. Um, except this one's small, so you get much more access to all of that stuff that is normally inside quite a lot of metal casing. Um, Samuel, who's the PDRA at Cambridge, who has led the development of this in recent years, um, has also added an LED array illuminator uh, to the Delta stage so that you can do all sorts of fun uh, phase imaging and contrast methods. The um, mechanical performance of the microscope uh, is one that we've cared about since the very start. Um, so this is some of the, the very first experiment um, that was done on it. I don't know if you can see the random laser pointer wandering about on my screen. I don't know where that's come from. Um, but uh, the plot here is an Allen variance. I will not mathematically define what that means other than to say that uh, on short timescales, less than a second, we're dominated by, by noise in tracking where the particles are. Um, and then on timescales of greater than a second, we start seeing drift in the system, as you do in, in any microscope. Um, but this drift is being measured in nanometers. Um, so even uh, over an hour, you still expect probably less than a micron of drift, which is doing pretty well. As well as the mechanics of it, we've put a lot of effort into the software. Um, this is the party piece of the microscope where I'm doing an autofocus. Um, and I've not sped this video up. So it really does do an image-based autofocus in a few seconds. Um, and that, of course, is very important to all sorts of smart microscopy experiments, because as soon as you want to run your microscope for longer than an hour, you definitely are going to, at some point, need to refocus. Um, and being able to do that reliably is key. One of the things we do with our um, blood samples is we will scan uh, lots of fields of view and stitch them together. And at that point, you really start to learn about how reliable everything is. And so actually, the autofocus method that I, I showed you previously looks great, works most of the time. But if you're taking tens of thousands of images, it's always going to fail at some point. Um, and so in order to get these scans, what Joel, uh, the PhD student uh, who did this, um, implemented was a smart Z stacking routine where it not only uses the autofocus to get to the right place, um, it acquires a stack of images, and then it checks that the middle image is the sharpest, and it will keep going until it's got a good Z stack uh, or until it's really sure that something's gone badly wrong. Similar to, to the stuff in Z, we can calibrate the microscope in X and Y. Um, so what I'm showing here is just click to move, um, which is fairly standard in a nice automated digital motorized microscope. Uh, but nonetheless, it was important to have that in our software. Um, and so it will calibrate itself and then allow you to move to particular points in the image, um, which is very helpful if, for example, you want to take lots of spectra of particles on a sample. Or, that kind of thing. Um, and we built in, again, to the microscope software, uh, one-click calibration. So you, you click go and then come back a couple of minutes later, and it should have given you a little report that will tell you not only about the scaling and rotation and flipping in the system, but also it should have figured out any backlash present in the gears, um, which we usually expect some. Um, and it should allow us to uh, do kind of closed loop moves where we correct for any backlash or error in the system. Um, so here, the middle graph 
is what you get if you don't do the correction. Um, and then the right hand graph is what you get once you add in a little bit of uh, closed loop correction using the camera effectively as an encoder. So all of this <clears throat> work to add in little building blocks uh, into the software is largely so that the open flexure microscope can become a part of a bigger experiment. The microscope itself um, has a camera and a, some motors with uh, motor control electronics, and it has an embedded Raspberry Pi. And the embedded Raspberry Pi is important because it means that we have a very well controlled environment that handles all of our difficult grungy hardware control code. Um, there's Python code that runs on that Pi. Um, and I don't have to worry about getting that code to run on your computer um, because all of the device drivers are on the Pi. Um, you can plug a monitor into that and use it directly, but most of the time we use it over the network. Um, and the network interface, rather than being something that is specific to one particular toolkit, we use an HTTP server. Um, and the power of that is that it's not only compatible with our nice graphical front end, but it's also compatible with different scripting clients and indeed any language that's capable of making an HTTP call. Um, so most recently, we've got a Blockly interface, which for anyone familiar with Scratch or teaching kids to code um, is, is quite a cool way to program a new system. Um, this open interface means that it should be very easy to uh, integrate with anything else that can talk HTTP, which these days is pretty much any language you like and a growing number of bits of hardware and software. Um, this slide is to prompt me to talk about some very fun work that we did together with Imjoy and the UC2 team, um, where we have a microscope, actually not an open flexure microscope, but running our software inside a UC2 pipetting robot, um, sorry, an OpenTrons pipetting robot, which is also a piece of open source hardware and also has an HTTP interface. Um, so we've got microscopy, we've got sample preparation, and then we've got Imjoy, which is a machine learning framework. Um, they all talk together using this web um, framework. And so it means that uh, Benedict was able to put together a really fun um, integrated closed loop experiment um, just by stitching together a bunch of different open source parts, uh, which I think really shows the potential of this kind of approach. At this point, I'm going to uh, give a shout out to the Open Flexure team. Um, a huge amount of work has been done by my team at the University of Bath. Um, several postdocs and PhD students have, uh, have done a lot of the work that I've talked about so far. Um, I should also mention BTEC, who are our collaborators in Tanzania. Um, they're engineers. Uh, they are a, a company that span out of one of the universities in Dar es Salaam. Um, and they, we hope, are the people who are going to sell open flexure microscopes eventually for medical use. Talking of medical use, uh, we also work with Ifakara Health Institute, um, and that's a, a medical research institute in Tanzania. Um, they're based a couple of hours up the coast in Bagamoyo. And last but by no means least, uh, there is still an active team working on this in the University of Cambridge. Uh, Samuel, who I mentioned in connection with the Delta stage, um, and others uh, working with Pietro Chikuta in the Cavendish. I'll put a, a virtual team photo here. Uh, virtual team photo because we've never all been in the same place. Um, and that's just a function of how this project worked even before the pandemic. <coughs> and that was good timing. Um, so uh, yes, we're spread across continents, um, but we all keep in touch through various digital means, largely the same infrastructure that supports open source software projects. Um, we tend to use and or abuse for our hardware development. So I've said it's a, a big global project. Um, I'll start by showing you a picture of Joram in his lab at Ifakara Health Institute, showing off a couple of open flexure microscopes uh, and some red blood cells on his slide. Um, we had a very fun collaboration with a group based in Nairobi, um, well, a UK NGO tech for trade um, and their partners in Nairobi. 
Uh, this is a print farm that churned out 50 microscopes over the course of a month or so uh, as part of a pilot program with local schools uh, using digital microscopy to get a bit of practical science into the classroom. We have printed a lot of microscopes. Um, this collection of microscope bodies comes from the baseline print run that we did with BTEC just to demonstrate that they could reliably make microscopes. Um, it's also been to some very fun places. Uh, Julian Sterling uh, is pictured there. He's one of the postdocs from Bath, um, using an open flexion microscope in the middle of the rainforest in Panama. Um, and we learned a lot from these kind of field trials, just about how you use a microscope in, a, in an example uh, environment that's not my nice, well-equipped development place. Um, and, uh, Last, I will put up a picture of a microscope on the Antarctic ice sheet um, that was taken there to have a look at snow algae, uh, which is very cool. I actually uh, stuck one in my freezer for a couple of days just to check that it didn't fall to pieces before it went out. Um, here is an example I alluded to earlier um, from Brian Patton's group at the University of Strathclyde, uh, where they were able to take the open flexure microscope and modify it to do super resolution imaging with um, nano diamonds, uh, which just blew me away because the first I heard about this, this work was um, when I was on the way to a conference and spotted it in the program. Um, and indeed they had, they'd taken the open source designs and they've been able to get super resolution working on it without actually needing to bother us, uh, which was very cool. Another uh, collaboration that's grown out of the fact that it's been openly shared um, is with Daniel Rosen in uh, Baylor Co College of Medicine uh, in Texas. Um, he's there using a, a microscope as part of teaching pathology. Um, apparently it's, uh, it's very helpful for him to be able to control the microscope and then all of the students can follow along watching what the microscope sees on their iPhones. Um, I guess that gets around that classic problem of how do I know what you're seeing down those eyepieces? Um, he has collected together a, a big data set of um, stitched images of different pathology samples, um, which are all available online for, for pathology teaching purposes. The, uh, the long road to diagnosis is, um, I guess, my way of referring to the process of going from an idea that seemed promising to a concept that was proven to a prototype that works really quite reliably to now a device that's been reproduced hundreds of times in different labs. Um, but getting from there to a medical device is still quite a big journey. Um, so at the moment, we have some microscopes that run quite happily in a Fakara Health Institute's lab. Um, they're looked after by Joram, who is a member of our team and we've worked with him closely for a few years. But uh, in the last year, he has then trained up some technicians in some of the local clinics to be able to use a ruggedized version of the microscope. And the ruggedization incidentally was done in Tanzania. Um, so they have a, a version of the microscope in a sturdy box that they can use then in their clinic. Um, and so I've never spoken to the people who are doing that. Um, and I think that's starting to get to a more realistic scenario. Um, BTEC, which is where these microscopes are produced, um, they've set up some dedicated space for microscope production. They're starting to implement all of the measures that you're going to need in order to sell this to a regulated market. Um, and we're working with them to try and generate the paperwork that's needed to approve this as a medical device so they can actually sell it to healthcare facilities. <coughs> Now, um, all of this community work, and especially the medical work, takes a lot of documentation. Um, one piece of documentation that has taken a significant fraction of my time and effort on the project ever since the very start is the assembly instructions. Um, these have been rewritten countless times. Um, we still don't have them perfect, but we've evolved from a sort of a long piece of wittering prose with the occasional photograph to now some very punchy point by point assembly instructions intended for people who are really making this um, and want to do it efficiently and well um, and not read all of the chit chat. And then we're trying to link in 
um, the design rationale and the, oh, well, you could do it like this, but it's actually better to do it like that sort of discussion um, into a, a kind of network of documentation. So you have your good assembly instructions, but you also retain that really valuable kind of design rationale, design history. Um, but as well as assembling it, you need to be able to control it. So we have um, documentation on the software API. We have an automatic configuration tool to let you download just the right parts to print. Um, and in fact, uh, Julian has worked on a number of projects um, aiming to help the kind of infrastructure of how do you make good um, documentation for a hardware project? How do you version manage it appropriately? How do you enable people to contribute uh, back to the project? Um, and also we have perhaps this does count as documentation, I'm never quite sure. Um, but we have a friendly web page to try and direct people to all of these different bits of information um, and also a forum. And the forum is, is great fun. Um, it's been going about a year now. And since opening up that forum, we've really seen the microscope community explode. Before that happened, we were relying on um, collaboration through things like issues on GitLab, um, which is a very good way to track things that need doing on the microscope. But I think a lot of people who are not used to the um, open source software world perhaps find the GitLab Im interface really quite intimidating. Um, and so having a nice friendly forum where people can pop up and say, hello, show what they're using the microscope for, ask some questions, help us improve. Um, that's really useful. Um, and so if anyone is, is interested in getting involved, uh, I would commend you to openflexure.org and please do say hello on the forum. Uh, with that, I have um, reached my finishing slide. Uh, I hope I'm not too much under time, but uh, I've rarely been complained at for talking for too little time. Um, and that leaves lots more room for questions, uh, which I hope we will have lots of. So I'll leave this up to, to perhaps remind you of some of the additional things um, that I talked about. And yes, please do ask some questions. Great, thank you very much for that. That was a brilliant talk. So if anyone has any questions, please put them in the chat and we'll uh, we'll deal with them. In the meantime, I believe Kirsty has uh, the quiz to see whether people were paying attention. Yeah, so I'll just share the Mentimeter link. Yeah, we have quite a few questions also. So everyone here is the Mentimeter link and if you can log in, uh, we can take questions. Uh, is it worth me um, trying to answer one or two of these while people click on the link? Yeah, why not? Yeah, while you wait, yeah. Um, Ian asks if we've integrated the new Pi Camera 2. Um, the Pi Camera 2 is not all that new. And yes, that's our default camera. Uh, if you mean the new high quality Pi camera, I believe some people on the forum have put together microscopes using the high quality camera module. Um, I've not done one personally. The issue is actually that the, um, the larger sensor, the, the microscope's designed for a very small sensor on the version two. The larger sensor means that the edges of the sensor mostly just get out of focus gunk. Um, and so it doesn't help as much as you'd think. Um, but we would we would quite like to try uh, a different version of the optics that are designed for the um, high quality camera. Uh, there's a, a question about connecting the Delta stage up to some Thor Labs systems. Um, I've not done that either. Uh, there is an adapter somewhere that will connect the Delta stage into a UC2 um, modular system. I don't think there's an adapter for Thor Labs. Uh, but it would be lovely to um, put one together. Um, so yes, that's uh, that's something that, well, pop up on the forum and ask, uh, and I'm sure we'll figure something out. Uh, we might be able to give you some some hints to get you started on the right bit of the design. Yeah. So shall we start the quiz? 
and then we take uh, you can put more questions in i think we we are doing good on time so we can take more questions after the quiz and let's see how many of you are sleeping and awake so um, so the first question uh, we don't have the warm up question this time so the first question is the open flexion microscope is released under which license sun open hardware license gnu gpl cc by 4 all of the above Oh dear, I'm not sure I actually put this in the talk, did I? <laughs> <laughs> I will really sort people out. The, the order might be wrong, like, uh, but yeah, I think you, you you gave us six questions, and we could only in the free version of Mentimeter, we could only accommodate five of them. So ah, okay, this one. So yeah, seven people are in the in the race. Yeah, so well done. The leader board. So Pion Setia is leading with ESP and SKIDS. Mr. Micro, is it the Micron people with Mr. Micro? So the second question is coming up and in the latest version, uh, we have focused on improving the mechanical performance, adding more optics options, reliability and quality control, super resolution. I would be so happy if you would have focused on super resolution with your like, I hope like at some point we bring down the two million price <laughs> two thousand. So a factor of at least three, three orders of magnitude cheaper. Oh. So yeah, I think I think uh, our team have focused on initially the mechanical performance and now on making it more reliable. Um, I think that potentially makes it a reasonable thing to build super resolution onto um, but uh, we're not super resolution experts so we need to we need to collaborate with people to bring that one in um, I'm, I'm going to send you an email soon after this <laughs> please do presentation um, so the next question is coming up oh the leaderboard uh, let's see who has gone on the top ESP. I can only guess the full form of ESP. Maybe you can write the full form while we take the next question. How tall is the open flexion microscope? Richard, you mentioned a lot about uh, shoe box. Was it like stead in a shoe box that, that became very popular? Um, I mean, it's just it's just the size it ended up being. Um, okay. and yeah. I think everyone almost got this. Uh, it's, it's, um, yeah, so. Let's yeah, see. that one actually was in the talk. <laughs> I think people guess how big a shoe box is. Um, I think ESP is still leading by, by a fair margin now. So. So we go on to the next question. What language is Microscope's hardware control code written in? I guess MATLAB would not be an option, right? Because it's not open source. This that leaves us with Python and, <laughs> and JavaScript might be too hard. I don't know C plus plus again. So yeah. I mean the the interface is basically written in mm -hmm. JavaScript. Um, and uh, I, I was too much of a wuss to do it in C++. I think C++ is almost dead, right? Like with Python, uh, the speed is good and everything is. I mean, I, I think C++ will, or, or C will never actually be dead because most of the really high performance Python stuff is calling mm -hmm. C under the hood. Um, yeah. It's just that most of us mere mortals don't need to worry about it anymore. Yeah. Also, a lot of old people still code in C++. Uh, <laughs> that was a mean comment. So, <laughs> uh, so our leader leaderboard, ESP, and I think looks like JC will take over this time. The leaderboard. So we have one uh, new acronym to guess what JC stands for. Um, the last question and be fast if you want to win full scope. Uh, Richard, do you think we can give out uh, open flexure scopes as a prize? 
can we afford you? Sadly, we've not been able to bring the price down quite as far as Foldscope. Um, so that would be nice, like to give uh, at least the printed body, if not the optics, just the printed body. You can give out, and people, as you said, can add their own optics. So. Mm. Well, I think I think the most useful thing to give out is the uh, the little bag of nuts and bolts. Um, so we we have a micro business trying to sell kits, um, and the thing we mostly sell is a little bag of all the nuts and bolts that you need to put it together. Because most people are able to find a printer um, and to buy a Raspberry Pi, but getting just the the right number of M3 screws is surprisingly annoying. On, on that note, uh, uh, we are almost two years into Imaging One World, and we haven't been able to think of a appropriate appropriate gift for our speakers. So maybe I will talk with Georgina, Jess, Alex, and others. Maybe we give your open flexure, at least the printed body to our speakers. <laughs> it would be a good advertisement for us and you both. So, so I'll yeah. discuss that because most of our speakers are microscopists. So it should be quite interesting for them also. When moving plus five millimeters from zero in XY plane, the stage will move in Z by. Less than 20 microns, 20 to 100, 100 to 500 microns, more than 500. So, yeah, uh, these are big limits for super -res. Yeah, this is where I'm realizing how naughty I've been that I uh, put the questions together before I reworked the talk and now I've, <laughs> now I've changed. Um, I think this was a killer question which would uh, just uh, disturb our leaderboard. And let's see who finally won. Uh, Looks like Bell got the answer right, and he might just take over. Oh, yeah, so appropriate that Bell is winner of this talk, whosoever it, but it's a very nice name. So, so Bell, uh, if, if you send Georgina or any one of us your email address, we will send you a fold scope. So that's all for the quiz, and I see some new questions have popped up. So there's one question from Rich Cole asking how many cycles can you get before it cracks and breaks? So I guess what the duty, what, how robust are the, the microscopes? Um, so in terms of moving the flexure back and forth, so long as you stay within the elastic limit, so as long as you, you use it in the manner intended, because there's stops built into the microscope to stop it bending too far, um, I have actually struggled to break them. So I had one on fatigue test continuously for about 18 months. Um, and the experiment was terminated by me knocking it off the shelf rather than by anything going <laughs> on with the microscope. Um, we do see them fail more quick, more uh, frequently in Tanzania. Um, and I think it's a combination of the humidity and also the variable quality of the filament that they're able to get hold of. Um, I think if you've got good quality PLA filament and if you're using it, um, and you know, not dropping it or whatever, it should last for a very long time. And um, yeah, I've certainly had them in continuous service for for more than a year. So, um, so there was a and, comment from. Oh, sorry. Yep. Uh, sorry, sure. I was just going to say that was continuously moving backwards and forwards on a fatigue test, so it's moving quite a lot more than um, your typical lab microscope would. So no, that's quite an impressive uh, fatigue test, actually. So, but it failed the knocked off the shelf test. <laughs> Yes, it's not it's not um, robust to being knocking off the shelf, but uh, then again, neither is a thirty thousand pound Olympus. Um, oh, that's also true. Also the true, difference so. is with an open flexure, you're prepared to test it. Uh, yes. So, uh, so, so Ian Toppy uh, commented that there's Octave, which uh, is an open source re-implementation of MATLAB, so uh, which might be worth a look at. Um, and then Brad Amos has a question. I don't know why Brad could turn his camera off and ask, but I'll ask unless he does. Yeah, and it would um, be nice to see you actually after some but, um, for coming to our talk series. Um, but basically, do you plan to improve the intermediate optics to increase the for larger format uh, chip cameras um, as they're becoming cheaper because of the kind of astronomy market or the amateur? Sure. Um... I mean, I think I could certainly see us bringing out another optics module designed for, for example, the um, Raspberry Pi high quality camera, which I can't remember how big the sensor is. Is, is it half inch? Um, so it's bigger. It's still not kind of large format, um, but that would potentially allow us to get rid of our tube length correction lens. So the, the optics module at the moment um, uses an extra lens 
even though it's got a finite conjugates microscope objective, because we want to project an image that is about a third of the usual size. Um, so that means that your, your Raspberry Pi camera chip, which is, is it four millimeters diagonal, something like that, yeah. um, instead of just getting the central one fifth of your field of view, that is then actually capturing most of your field of view. Um, so we're matching the small sensor to the, the optics. Um, we could get rid of that lens and have a longer optics module, probably in the delta stage, because um, in the regular microscope, the whole optics module moves up and down. And so having it be really big and bulky would be a problem. Um, but yeah, it would be nice to support that. In terms of larger format still, I think at that point, you're really going to want to lay the intermediate optics out um, flat on a table. So something like the adapter to couple it into UC2 or other adapters to um, effectively couple in external optics would do a better job than anything I'm likely to put into the built-in little optics module that we have. Um, and of course, I, I don't need to tell Brad Amos that um, there is a limit on how many useful pixels you're going to want um, that comes from the microscope objective. And so actually, if you want to couple in a large format sensor with, with lots of big pixels, you probably also want to spend rather more than we do on the objective lens. And possibly we'd want to swap that out for something bigger or different. I almost forgot the size of meso lens. Is it the same size as your 200 millimeter open flexure? Hmm. You know what? Ne next time in... <laughs> Next time I'm in Glasgow, I should really uh, take a trip over to Strathclyde and put an open flexure microscope next to a meso lens. Um, yeah. That's a photograph I definitely want. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. So I don't think there's any other questions unless anyone wants to put their hand up and ask a, a question or type it in. I mean, so one question I guess I was thinking about was what next for what, uh, what are you looking at in the future? Sure. Um, I mean, I think one thing that we're really excited about um, is just this prospect of actually getting it certified as a medical device in Tanzania. Um, because I think having a project that is completely open source, that is also certified as a medical diagnostic, um, it would prove a lot of interesting things in the kind of tech transfer space. Um, and it would also solve a problem that actually exists in Tanzania, which would be really exciting. Um, I don't think there are currently um, any domestically produced in vitro diagnostics. Um, so that would be a that would be a cool first. Um, we're also very keen to expand the number of people who are using it as a, a component in a bigger system. Um, and so, yeah, seeing it get integrated with different experiments is very exciting to us. Um, and I'm keen to both do more of that myself and uh, figure out how to enable it um in other places so uh, uh, you might have heard about manu prakash who uses cold scope for malaria diagnostics so do you see some uh, meeting point of open flexure and cold scope and he also has a number of low cost uh, you know centrifuge and things like those so do you see how we can combine both or yeah i mean i think each other? i think fold scope and open flexure are aiming at aiming at different places. So fold scope is amazing because you get a microscope for what, one pound, one dollar. Um, but it's a very different kind of microscope. Um, and so I think with the open flexure system, we're aiming at something that is a bit more akin to what you would find in a lab um, for you know automated experiments or where you need motorized control um, rather than kind of for a dollar, you can now see something that you couldn't see before, but it's kind of quite fiddly. Um, I think it's slightly more sophisticated versions of whole scope, which cost us a bit more depending on the lens. <laughs> yeah. It's still a, like, yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I think there are a number of cool projects that have come out of that group that are perhaps better matched to open flexure. There's the um, OctoPi microscope mm -hmm. that I think is kind of pitched at a, a similar niche. Um, so yeah, it's, there's definitely possibilities for integrating an open flexure microscope with um, various ways of particularly doing things like sample prep. Um, so centrifuges and that sort of thing. There's um, uh, Samuel at Cambridge, who I mentioned, uh, has also been working on an automatic blood smear preparation machine, um, 
which, uh, yeah, that obviously would pair very nicely with a microscope. I think there's also open frame at Imperial. Um, I'm not sure if you covered that because I escaped for a few minutes during your talk, but that, that sounds similar, right? So. Yes, I mean, it's, it's I guess, probably uh, higher up the food chain again than open flexure because it's all mechanically machined. Um, so, um, yeah, there are kind of different, different options. Um, although I think open frame doesn't actually handle the kind of motion control itself. You would mm -hmm. buy that in from ASI or, or whoever. Um, okay. So can take one so, last question, Alex. Is the yeah, there's one. Yep. So, uh, one last question. Um, I guess what if you, uh, when it comes to designing robust 3D printing structures, what are the key things you've learned to, for this pro in this process? Sure. Um, I think the the key lesson is just that plastic is not metal, and so when you're designing something for plastic, in the same way that when you're designing something to be machined, you need to keep in mind sort of the machining process, and uh, and that puts certain constraints on what you can do. You have the same thing with plastic. Um, so, for example, if you're machining something, you might often put a threaded hole in, um, because that's quite an easy thing to do if you're having it made in a workshop. Um, if you're making it out of plastic, actually, it's probably better to put a nut trap in. Machining a nut trap is really annoying. Printing a nut trap is really easy. Tapping a piece of metal works really well. Tapping a piece of plastic results in a thread that is quite weak. Um, so use nut traps uh, is a good thing that I learned. Um, and also just things like if you if you pay attention to how things are printed, um, you can, for example, use bridges instead of overhangs, and that can save a huge amount of support material. Um, so one of the things that we put a lot of effort into with the microscope was figuring out how to make it print reliably without needing support material, because that then means you spend a lot less time cleaning up the support material and you get a much nicer part afterwards. Excellent. Yes. I, yeah. The whole bridging and support material, I guess, is also a cost that you want to uh, you want to save. So, uh, so yeah. yeah. Although I, I suspect the time of the person cleaning it up costs far more than the plastic. <laughs> wow, that's true. Even in Tanzania. Indeed. So, yeah. Um, so okay. Well, in that case, there's uh, no more questions. So that was a brilliant talk. Thank you very much for that. And um, Thanks for having me. No, it's a, it's a pleasure. And uh, thank you to everyone for turning up. And uh, we'll hopefully see everyone after the holidays in January. Yeah, thanks. So